ever tried to grow your plants in Lekka, but things did not go too well? Lekka being clay balls, that is. Well, you're in the right place because in this video, I'll be discussing the five things you absolutely should not do when you're growing your plants in Lekka. Now, if you're new to the concept of hydroponics in general or Lekka specifically, don't worry, I got you covered. So semi-hydroponics is a method of growing plants using the efficiency of hydroponics. So you've got a lot of water, you've got a lot of nutrients, and you use media like a leka or pond. And this offers an excellent balance between ease of care of your plants. It's really easy, but your plants also grow really, really well. So the ease of care and the gorgeous plants that you get is why growing plants in semi-hydroponics is becoming very popular. But here's the thing. Even though semi-hydroponics brings fantastic results, there are some crucial do's and don'ts to keep in mind. So with the invaluable insights from a blog post by my dear friend Eve, the Lekka Addict, I'll serve as your guide to uncover the five things you should avoid when growing your plants in semi-hydro. Hold on tight and stay tuned because the last item on our list is an absolute game changer and you won't want to miss it, so keep watching. So the first thing is do not repot or adjust your plant every few weeks. Now, this is a commonly discussed topic within semi-hydro social media communities. The roots are thriving and the roots are growing into the reservoir and people feel the need to do something about the length of the roots. So most of the recommendations are one, repotting your plant every few weeks to move the roots up so that the roots are not in the reservoir. Another recommendation is a flushing by taking the plant out, rinsing the lacquer really well and then repotting the plant. Note, I will not be demonstrating this because I love my plant babies too much. Another recommendation is to take the plant out every few weeks, trim the roots and put it back. Now, mm -hmm. these methods will eventually disturb the growth of your plant or even kill it. Why? Plants do not like their roots disturbed. That is just the fact. Not to mention that you would have to be repotting your plant regularly. Ain't nobody got time for that. So what should you do with your overgrown roots in Lekka? If you're using the submerged method, as I do, that is the nursery pot sitting in the nutrient solution, the roots will eventually grow out of the drainage holes. They just will. Allow the roots to thrive in the reservoir as they naturally grow into it. As it's completely normal and it's actually beneficial for the plants. If after a few months you notice that there's some decay, which again is normal, simply remove or trim the decaying root hairs with your hands or with your scissors. And of course, when the reservoir is completely dominated by the roots, you'll need to water more frequently. But and that, at that point, it is recommended to repot the plant into a bigger pot. Now that is a discussion for another video though. This is my philodendron white knight. It rooted very well in Lekka and was growing well. See the video where I showcase it above. I repotted her as a demonstration for a show I was doing to demonstrate how to repot a plant in Lekka. She did not like being disturbed at all and I'm now having to coax her back to life. Worst case scenario, I might lose the plant altogether. So moral of the story, do not disturb the roots of your plant unless you absolutely must. The next no-no is do not assume that your tap water is okay to use. Water quality varies greatly across the world. So as you know, tap water contains minerals and dissolved solids that may eventually affect the long-term growth of your plants that are living in semi-hydroponics. Dissolved minerals in the water, such as calcium, magnesium, and others, will affect the pH and the nutrient availability to the plant. So when you have an imbalance of these minerals and the pH, that might actually cause a nutrient lockout. And a nutrient lockout occurs when the plants are actually not able to absorb the basic nutrients needed to remain healthy. So what should you do? get your water tested. You could even invest in a simple pH and TDS meter 
check every time you mix up a fresh batch of solution so you know that the pH of the nutrient solution is in the optimal range, which is about 5.5 to 6. If possible, you might consider investing in an under sink reverse osmosis system or a portable one for water purification. Alternatively, a high quality carbon based filtering pitcher or using distilled water is a recommended option. This is the TDS meter that I use to check the total dissolved solids of my water. I discuss TDS in an earlier video linked above. I should mention that if you have tested the pH of your solution numerous times and it looks the same every time you do it, there really is no need to be testing every single time. I certainly don't. I test it you know, once in a while, and I see that the parameters are just normal, exactly where I need them to be. So I'm confident in the fact that when I mix up my solution, it's just right. This next one is a very, very controversial no-no, and it comes up a lot in a lot of semi-hydro forums. Do not use organic fertilizers in semi-hydroponics. Just don't. Of course, while organic fertilizers are great for use in soil, their application in semi-hydroponics or semi-hydroponic setups presents some very distinct challenges. The most important concept to understand is that organic fertilizers rely on the soil biome or ecosystem to break down the organic matter in the nutrients, such as fish emulsion, worm castings, guano, and so on, into essential components in the form that the plant can absorb them for plant growth, okay? And this biome is made up of bacteria, fungi, other organisms. This process of breaking down the organic matter can be achieved in hydroponics or semi-hydroponics using very complex processes, which involve biofilters and all sorts of things, which are way too complicated for most of us to bother. So to keep things simple, it's advisable to just keep away from using products containing, you know, organic things, worm castings, compost tea, stuff like that. What is recommended is the use of synthetic or inorganic fertilizers that are easier to apply in the quantities that's needed. These inorganic fertilizers offer readily available nutrients that the plant can readily absorb. And the important thing is these nutrients are readily available. If you're using organic fertilizers like fish emulsions, banana peel water, stuff like that, it can actually make your reservoir quite smelly. That's, you know, and uh, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> If you're finding this video informative, if you're finding value from it, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. The next no-no, do not use fertilizers that do not have a published guaranteed analysis. Now this is another controversial one, but listen up people. Fertilizer analysis refers to the fertilizer's formulation of the three macronutrients, that's nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, and it's commonly referred to as the NPK. So fertilizer guaranteed analysis is the standard way to share this information. So they need to write that. So an NPK value, for example, of 1055 means that the fertilizer contains 10% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus and 5% potassium. Understanding the composition and quantities of the nutrients in the fertilizer is really important and crucial in semi-hydroponics where we are wanting to give our plants precise feeding. And it's really, really important, more so than compared to traditional so soil growing. Additionally, the label of a guaranteed analysis provides percentages of the various macro and micronutrients. And one of the reasons it's really important to know what's in your fertilizer or your nutrient is if there are any particular gaps or if there's a specific plant that you're growing that has got a different need. So maybe your plant needs more calcium or it needs more magnesium or it needs more nitrogen. You can actually supplement that and that makes sure that your plant thrives in the way that it should. You would not be able to do that if you did not know what the guaranteed analysis of your nutrient solution is. The next no-no, some people might not like, but it has to be said. Do not take social media advice without thinking it through 
do your own research. For me, this is really one of the most important no-nos. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about and Derek, the chocolate botanist, and I discussed it extensively during our chat. See the link to the podcast above. When we grow plants in semi-hydro, it can be hard to find good information. We often go to social media for help, but how can we know that the advice we get is really helpful? There are lots of groups online where people talk about growing plants without soil. Some of these people have got lots of experience, which is fantastic, but not everyone says how much experience they have when they're giving this advice. If my good friend, the Lekka Addict, suggests, and I agree, that you do a few things to help navigate this maze. So the first thing is you become familiar with who you're listening to. Get to know these people. If possible, find out how long they've been doing this kind of gardening. How long have they been growing in semi-hydroponics before you trust what they say? You really also want to learn about the different ways in which they set up their pot. What are their pot configurations? You want to know how they change their plants from soil to lecker or semi-hydroponics. But you also want to know their stories about their successes and their failures. You can even search these groups to see if someone else has asked similar questions before. And this gives you a good idea about what's worked for other people. Remember, we're not living in isolation. But of course, the most important thing is remember what works for one person might not work for someone else because we all have different growing conditions and we all have different plants. It's always better to try things out and learn from your own experiences instead of always just listening to what other people say on social media. Of course, I really do have to address the elephant in the room, at least for me anyway, YouTube. YouTube is another place where you can find a lot of information, but again, you have to be careful. I'm probably shooting myself in the foot here, but you know, the truth hurts. It's hard to know how long someone has been doing this type of gardening when they're making a video. People like me. Sometimes people will make a video showing how to do something and then they'll change their method later on. And of course, the problem is that that old video is still there. So people might try something that doesn't necessarily work anymore, at least not for that person who made that video. People are allowed to evolve, people evolve, people change their practice. And sometimes this might not be particularly evident when someone watches one video out of hundreds on someone's YouTube channel. So you still have to take that advice with a pinch of salt and do your research. It always comes back to doing your research and knowing the person you're getting the information from. Videos can also be fun to watch, but don't believe everything you see. There's a lot of editing that goes on in the background. Out of everything, what's really important is to find a community of like-minded people who are happy to experiment and question. Question everything. I'm really fortunate to be in the great company of people like Eve, the liquor addict, Alison J, and many others I share ideas with, and that enhances my liquor journey. So find your people. Now check out this next video where I discuss the nine beginner mistakes to avoid when moving plants from soil to liquor. I'll see you there.